Welcome. In this example, I'm going to briefly go over how to conduct an ordinary least squares regression analysis using JASP. So in this example, there are three predictor variables, x1, x2, and x3, and one outcome variable, y. And we're going to attempt to generate an equation to see if we can predict y with x1, x2, and x3 using linear regression. So I'll go to regression and then linear regression and I will enter the outcome variable into the dependent variable box and I will enter the predictors into the box labeled covariates. Under model, I'll leave it alone because I'm just going to test the straightforward equation. If I wanted to do something with interaction terms or if I wanted to do a sequential regression where I was looking at the relationship of, let's say, a chunk of predictors above and beyond a previous chunk of predictors, then I would go in there and specify those options. And I will leave the method as enter because I'm not doing a type of regression that's a stepwise or a statistical method for selecting predictors. I'm just going to put them all into the equation at once. Under statistics, there's probably some things we want to select that are not the default. Uh, we'll probably want to look at the confidence intervals. Might as well look at the means and the standard deviations, the semi-partial and partial correlations and the collinearity diagnostics. Uh, we could bootstrap the confidence intervals, uh, which is a somewhat more sophisticated way to do the confidence intervals, uh, especially in situations where we may have violated assumptions of the analysis or if we have funky distributions. But for now, we'll leave it alone because we'll just do it the straightforward way. And for... Now we'll just leave that as is. And there's some options uh, for if you are doing a, a stepwise regression analysis, which we're, which we're not. So we won't select any of, of the uh, further options. And we'll just take a look at the output and interpret the output. So here we have the first table. We just have one model that we tested. So there's just one model. Uh, we have the multiple R, or the multiple correlation coefficient, which basically is the correlation between our observed and predicted scores. So the equation predicts scores, and then we also have the observed scores for Y. So how well did our equation, uh, based on uh, linear relationships between our predictors and outcomes, how well did that do? Uh, well, the multiple R, multiple correlation coefficient is 0.5, which if you square that is 0.25, which is telling us our equation is predicting 25% of the variance of our outcome, which it doesn't sound awful. It's not, doesn't sound great, doesn't sound awful. But looking at the adjusted R squared, which attempts to correct for randomly associated variance and takes into account the number of predictors and the sample size and the like, it, it really does seem like the adjusted R squared is, is much less than our actual R squared. Uh, usually they're, they're in the same ballpark, but, but in this instance, they aren't. And then we also have the root mean squared error, which is our standard deviation of our observed scores around the predicted scores in from the equation. So that basically tells you the standard deviation of error in the regression co uh, equation, which here is 21.30. And that's in the units of the outcome variable. All right, moving on, we look at the ANOVA table. If we look at this ANOVA table, we start to realize that although our F observed indicates that our residual variance is smaller than our 
regression variants such that the regression variance is 1.76 times larger than the residual variance. It, the F observed is associated with a p-value of 0.19, which is in almost all situations much too high. So it's telling us that there's about a 20% probability that we would observe results like this. We'd result, we'd observe a 0.5 multiple r and a 0.25 r squared, given our sample size and our our uh, error in this in this study, we would find these results just by chance. These results are more extreme just by chance about 20% of the time. So that's much too high. So for this equation, we're 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 going to conclude that we're not doing a good job predicting the outcome because that p-value is just simply too high. Uh, at this point, in, if this was a real analysis that we were doing, we would uh, we would kind of just stop here and really not interpret our predictors because because there's a pretty good chance that our equation is just garbage. But we'll go on just so that we can see what's in this table. In the coefficients table, we have the, the y-intercept, or, or the constant, which just basically tells us what's the predicted value of the outcome, y, if our predictors are set to 0. So if x1, x2, and x3 are set to 0, what would the predicted value of y be? We see that the x1 variable has an unstandardized regression coefficient of 2.63. So what that means is after controlling for x2 and x3, basically partialing out their effects on the dependent variable, for each unit increase in x1, we would expect y to go up by 2.63. Likewise, we see that the unstandardized regression coefficient for x2 is 3.77, which means after controlling for the effects of x1 and x3, uh, each unit increase of x2 is expected to increase y by 3.77 units. And then finally for x3, after controlling for x1 and x2, we expect each unit increase in x3 to lead to a change in a decrease in y of negative 2.11. However, if we look at the standard errors for these regression coefficients, we'll note that they're considerably large relative to the coefficients themselves. Uh, so if you divide the standard error into the regression coefficient, that's the standard error of the regression coefficient into the regression coefficient, we get the t observed and each of these t observed is associated with a p-value which is much too high to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that we really can't say that any of these predictors are linearly related to the outcome variable. Uh, we also have the standardized regression coefficients, and those are interpreted similarly to the unstandardized regression coefficients, except they're in standard deviation units. So to interpret them, we would say, okay, after for x1, after controlling for x2 and x3, we would expect a standard deviation increase in x1 to be associated with a 0.23 standard deviation increase in y. Uh, the, the significance test for the standardized regression coefficients is the same as the st significance test for the unstandardized regression coefficient. Uh, so in this in this instance, we've got null effects across the board. Uh, here we also have the confidence intervals, which give us an idea of the range that we expect these coefficients to fall within in the population based on our sample information. So this is for the unstandardized regression coefficient. We ex the confidence interval for each is quite wide and contains zero. Uh, 
so we cannot rule out that there is no relationship between these predictors and the outcome. So in all instances, uh, we really don't know um, what the, the coefficient is, and we'll probably just assume that there's no relationship because the p-values are all much too high. A traditional cutoff is 0 0.05, lower than 0 0.05, and the lowest coefficient we have here is 0 0.21. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis across the board here for the overall equation and then also for each of the predictors. Uh, we might want to look at our collinearity statistics, which allow us to assess whether or not we have an issue where some of our predictors are too strongly correlated with each other. So the tolerance basically gives you the the one minus a, a r squared where you're using the other predictors to predict a given predictor. It basically tells you how much variance we have left over. So here we see there's 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.96. So no real problems here with uh, variance left over. It appears that uh, there's not a troublesome overlap between these variables, which would make it problematic to be able to assess their relationship with the outcome. And the variance inflation factor is, is just a reciprocal of tolerance. So for that, uh, for, for tolerance, it would be problematic if you saw levels of 0.2 or 0.1. And for variance inflation factor, if you see levels 10 or much larger than 10, then you start to be concerned that you have an issue with the overlap, too much overlap between your predictors, making it difficult to see what their independent relationships with the outcome variable would be. Right here we have a table just simply the descriptives, the mean, the standard deviation, the standard error, uh, sample size, stuff you'd want to report if you were writing up uh, an analysis using a regression equation. We also have a table with the part and, or I should say semi-partial Part is also known as semi-partial correlation and the partial correlations. So the semi-partial correlations are giving you the correlation between the residualized predictor and the outcome in its entirety. So not 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 nothing is partialed out of the outcome, but the other predictors are partialed out of each predictor. Whereas the partial correlation is giving you the relationship between the residualized x and residualized y, meaning that we're partialing, let's say, x2 and x3 out of x1, and we're partialing x2 and x3 out of y, and we're looking at what's the correlation after we control for x2 and x3 out of both x1 and y, whereas the semi-partial is looking at uh, what if we partial x2 and x3 out of x1 and then look at its correlation with y in its entirety, right? All right, so that's uh, the basics of how to uh, conduct and interpret a regression analysis using JASP. Now there are some things that uh, probably might get added later, hopefully, that would make this uh, a bit more complete. For instance, looking at the, um, the uh, assumption of homoscedasticity, there's uh, no, and the, ass the assumption of normality of variance, there's currently no options to, to be able to do that in JASP. Hopefully that'll be added in the future. Uh, but it's a, a pretty straightforward and, and uh, 
clean way to just quickly conduct a regression analysis. All right, I thank you for listening. I hope that, that you found that helpful.